Thank you for coming. I'm glad to see you here. Uh, when I continue, this is the third lecture. In the first lecture, I boldly introduced my project, which is to move on to the digital chapter of human history in our centuries-long turn to exotic populations with questions about contemporary concerns that until now we stopped at the modern age. I defined my I define my terminological cornerstones, the hunter-gatherer term, hunter-gatherer's context, for short hunter-gatherers, and interpretative comparison. So in the second lecture, I then introduce my theoretical framework through recent studies of hunter-gatherer so social networks. The scientists use 20th century social network analysis and they argue that social networks expanding beyond him, contributing to evolution of human cooperation and accumulated culture, and popular media picked up on the potential of, of reading this research as suggesting that hunter-gatherer social networks are something like the early origins of Facebook and other digitally based social networks. Meanwhile, at their end, sociologists of the digital society argue that the digitalized social network is something completely different from uh, what we had before. They're no longer a metaphor, they're no longer used as a model. They perform in the world. Uh, they constitute another ontological order which this sociologist suggests to call connective in distinction from what they call the collective, the collective, uh, and they spoke about new structures in the digitally based society, new forms of connective political action, connect, connected memory, connected social networks. Um, and what I want to do um, is to actually try and work with this, uh, with this uh, concept, with this framework of the connective, which uh, in co compared with the uh, framework that was used before of the collective, the collective ontological order assumes they are individuals, they share identities, they have relations, they belong to the group, the group is bounded, the group is exclusive, and in this, this term I will show how the gathers make no sense. So I will start, start, I will start by showing how we didn't understand hunter-gatherers because we used collective structures. And then I will see what sense we can make of them when we can re-approach them with connective structures. Uh, I just remind you, so this is a popular media, it's a slide that we produced from the previous lecture to those who haven't been here. And I want to I want to remind you as well that what the features that sociologists of the digital society stressed when they looked at phenomena which are digitally based are things like a loose coalition, sporadic participation with no commitment, flexibility and instability of social association, multiple and diverse individuals' perspectives reflecting their positional differences, associations that connect diverse people without erasing their diversity and differences, without unifying them through shared identity, without exclusive bounded groups. So today I will continue with my overall project and series of lecture and I'll turn to ethnography. Um, in this lecture I will turn together ethnography and I'll explore whether and how a connective framework helps to better understand the life of the cultures. In the fourth lecture, I will turn with connective framework and with my new perspective through the connective on hunter gathers to my recent ethnography, uh, which is of uh, sharing homes with the Airbnb platform, uh, the homestay option where the host stay at their homes and the guests live with them at their homes. So today we are with Hunter Gathers, and next week we go to Airbnb. Um, by Hunter Gathers today, I 
refer to hunter-gatherers who were studied since the 20th century, since the early 20th century, within hunter-gatherer studies uh, as an academic field. And they are widely found in the world, uh, in all parts of the world, and I focus especially on the South Asian, South Asian uh, groups, uh, one, and especially the Nayaka, who I studied personally. I shall introduce the Nayaka later. Uh, first, I want to share with you the rationale for turning to connective structure from the end of the gathers. Studies. Until now I told you, ha, ah, this connective structure, let's see what we can do with it. Now I want to show you why it's really needed from the hunter gather end to do it. By the mid-1960s, the comforting idea of clearly bounded hunter gather groups, exogamous, patrilineal, and patrilocal beds was relinquished. It was a nice idea, but it's not a fair return from the field with no evidence for it. One after one, they reported this nothing like it in the field, on the ground. Subsequent studies of hunter gathers right to the 1980s are notorious for describing what hunter gathers do not have. Groups are not bounded, their composition is not stable, and keep changing, and so on and so forth. I heard this the story that the first PhD draft of James Woodburn, later to become one of the leading scholars of hunter gatherers, his first PhD draft was rejected because his readers say, you just didn't found what you say that the hunter gatherers do not have. It, people couldn't accept that so much lack of features. Um, in 1983, when I wrote my thesis, I had to protect myself and say, reviews a negative orientation, as I called it, than a hunter gather study. So I just want to give you a few examples of the kind of stuff that were fields in literature, the ethnography, up to the 1980s. So Ernst who studied the Kadaransas, India, wrote very bluntly, uh, already in 1952, actually, <laughs> wrote it ahead of time. He wrote that a full appreciation of their negative qualities are necessary for the proper understanding of Kadar social life. Richard Lee, who studied the Kung in South Africa, summed the situation in, 70, in 1979, nearly 25 years later. And what he wrote, everyone agreed that the area formulations are inadequate because they are over, or very rigid and fail to account for the observed facts. But the problem remains, you wrote, of what to do analytically about the apparent chaos of hunter gatherer social arrangement. Not a no colored ethnographic description during these decades. To give you more examples, which are important for us, James Woodburn wrote, when he sees what accepted, uh, that the Hadza had there, uh, that, 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 uh, for the Hadza that there, I quote, simple residential unit is not a group with corporate functions. Fifteen years later, he wrote, I quote, they are not territorial based or other political groupings within Hadza society. Turn group, call it turn group, <coughs> the group, there is no form of centralized authority. Richard Lee quoted the reply to, uh, a Bushman reply to his question. Uh, he asked the Bushman, who is your leader? The Bushman said, we are all leaders. So this was quite negative, but he made the same point. Uh, Brian Morris, who studied uh, South Indian in Padua, wrote that they had little social organization. Claude Levi Strauss uh, went further and he wrote on the Nambiquara of South America uh, that he met on his travels in South America. I quote, I have been looking for a society reduced to its simplest expression. The society of the Nambiquara have been reduced to the point at which I found no society. Could these scholars argue that for lack, lacking collective actions and organizations, which anthropologists at the time expected to find in all societies? During these decades, sometimes ethnographers described what they did observe, even though it seems at the time impossible, incomprehensible. I must say, I must say that today, in retrospect, I can only be proud of. Uh, the 
professional and ethical integrity. Peter Gardner, for example, described for the South India Palian that even when for hunting a snake, they need to form a circle around it. Don't ask me why, I don't understand. But even when a circle is required, people just voluntarily joined, or no, as they wished, one after the other. Sometimes a circle was formed, sometimes it was left open. Woodburn suggested that the camp, to define the camp, simply as a set of persons who happened to be living together at one place at one time, which is much more clever than it seems then and now. I described how Nayaka believed an important festival hut for the other than human guests, cumulative, with no collectively introduced uh, or induced action. One day you just see one person comes and put a pole on the ground amid the hut. Days pass, nothing happened. Then a couple come and put another pole in a wall distance from the first pole. And so on, everybody comes and does what they want, and slowly, slowly, from joint connected action, not coordinated, not led, uh, the hut comes into form. Uh, Brian Morris wrote in 1976 that South India and Hilpandaram employed their classificatory system idiosyncratically. And I went two years afterwards to the field, and I checked it. And I found out that indeed, except for a very small core of plants, for which Nyka had shared name, informants often use their own names that others did not recognize. When it came to ethnic groups, the group, the names, the collective name for the collective groups, we really were into the wild west. I don't know if you know, names keep changing. As I say, Bushman, I should say, Kung, as I said, Duratsi. Names constantly change. Uh, I wrote about it in an article that I published in 2017, but I want to give you just one really extraordinary story that Sidney Howard wrote in a ethnography of the Malaysian hunter-gatherers Chewong. They were made recently very famous because we built the Castro, used them as a case of perspectivism beyond the confines of Amazonia. So listen to this. I take it from her, from her book. I, I checked this there. She, she said that this is true. A British warden asked a local ranger for the name of these people who were then living in the game reserve. The ranger thought that he was asked for the name of his employer and gave the British warden his name. But the warden was there, was hard of hearing. And what he heard was Chowong. Since then, all of us, or everybody who used the uh, de Castro, used Chowong. Story after story shows this incredible way in which we got to have ethnic names, collective names for the people, because they don't have ethnic names for themselves. They call themselves us, we the people, we relatives, etc. So again I ask, could this observation, such a lack of collective structures, hint towards connective structure, or at least the explanatory potential of a connective framework? Now most intriguing of all, was hunting as his kinship during those decades. Woodburn, who since the 1960s studies the Hatsda, the same Hatsda whose social network was studied half a century later by Akasela, and we went over it in the, next, in the previous lecture, he wrote that he expected as an anthropologist to find that their society was held together by kinship, uh, by mutual knowledge, kinship, rights, and obligations. It came, he writes, I quote him, is something of a shock to find out that this does not apply here. Other ethnographers noted that kinship relations and uh, the, the kinship terms do not carry rights and obligations. Uh, and would one then generalize for hunter gatherers that uh, kinship relations are not law bearing, they do not carry a heavy load of rights and obligations, but at the same time, he noted that they all use kinship terms all the time to address each other. He called it, if you remember, I mentioned it, universal kinship system. Everybody uses kinship terms for everybody else. That is our way. I don't say Maria, or I don't say, I say, hey, cousin, hey, in-law, or whatever. Um, this is generally played, and uh, one, one uh, Tonkinson, one historian who studied the Matu, 
in the 1960s, again the same model that scholastic social network 50 years later used, that we spoke about in the last lecture, he concluded that there is a major source of difficulty here. As kinship is all pervasive, yet regulates a little. It is not that kinship is not, not important, he concluded, only that it has some, a different significance, but he never got to pursue it. Only a few ethnographers pursued the subject. Um, I, I wrote a very early paper, even before I published my PhD, called Inside and Outside Kinship, and I looked at it. Fred Myers, in 1986, really brilliantly examined in his book on Pintupi how kinship relations are not forgiven but they must be worked out in a variety of social processes. A few ethnographers followed and showed how relating mates relatives, not a forgiving link in a logical template of fixed relationships, the distribution of food, living together, sharing presents, sharing the self, as Ingrid put it, all are means of making, affirming, and claiming uh, relations which are framed among the gathers by uh, as kinship. Now, kinship then disappeared. There were really few attempts, and then kinship disappeared from undergrad studies for various reasons that I explain elsewhere, including the ups and downs in kinship studies in anthropology generally uh, and other reasons. But it also lost attention to two escape routes away from the solid issues of undergrad's apparent lack of social features, of social forms. In both routes, nature trumps society as a study of, as a focus of study. So the first was the ecological escape route. Oh, wow, I forget. And I don't see the second. Okay. The first was an ecological escape route. that involved turning for an explanatory framework to hunt gathering as a mode of subsistence. Now everything could be explained in terms of adaptation to life based on unpredictable natural resources, both what, both what hunt together do, for instance sharing, and more acutely uh, what they don't do, for example, no steady wars. Flexible and stable groups, people moving from place to place and from group to group, degrouping and regrouping, no problem. These are means for coping better with unpredictable and changing resources. Means for maximizing access to and collection to and collecting of food. Now this explanatory strategy bordered on the tautological and left little room for social anthropologists. Ecological and evolutionary anthropologists could comfort themselves with increasingly sophisticated mathematical and statistical pursuits of this work around the social Social cultural anthropologists turned to the cosmological roundabout route. This route involved turning to the cosmological, to undergather their own perceptions of the environment and how they understand it, as first as an alternative framework uh, to the modern sense of nature for explaining hunter economies, and later just drifting into examining hunter ontologies. I argued quite early on in the 90s, I was one of the first to take this uh, escape route, I, I admit. So in my early 1990s work, exemplified the first phase and they started it off. I argued that Nayaka and other hunter-gatherers, tropical hunter-gatherers, tropical forest hunter-gatherers, uh, perceive their environment as a kind of parental being, a generous parent, parent who gives them resources. And I explain by that, I show how this perception of nature as a giving environment explains their economic rationale, economic decisions, economic activities. Uh, other kinship relations I later added dominate other happy gathered perception of the environment. So spousal relations is dominant in the cosmology of North Americans, progenitor and descendant relations among Australian Aborigines and namesake relationship about the Bushmen, all of them is different perceptions of environment, not as resources, but in terms of relations, really explain quite well what they do. Uh, by the late 1960s, economy along with kinship were all left on the 
outside, and we all really fully turned to Amazonians and hunter gatherer ontology, and in my case, epistemologies. We all know, widely known, Viverde Castro was developing his theory of perspectivism. Philip de Scolar, his fourfold grand classification of societies by how human and non-human are figured in terms of same different interiority and exteriority. Ingold developed his alternative environmental philosophy inspired by hunter-gatherers. Uh, more locally and specifically for hunter-gatherers, I will conceptualize their animism as a relational way of being with and knowing others and hunter, others and human beings. That means the excitement over alternative ways of approaching nature other than through the Western binary nature society, society was left outside. But, it, but left uncritically addressed, it cunningly preserved its collective categorist grip of society, of everything. Note that the scholar classifies four kinds of societies by how they categorize in, individual humans and non -human. Vivero de Castro described an Amazonian cosmos inhabited by species societies, each one constitutive of members who share common attributes, bodies, eyes, perspective. So the concept of society in collective terms found their way into description of radical alternatives to nature. A, my interest in hunter gatherers relational epistemology necessarily kept in the picture humans, the knowers, as and when they engage with non-humans for keeping good relations with them, but fully addressing hunter-gatherers apparent lacking social order is something else. And in my book I tried already to deal with this issue and I think that it can be pursued much better through the theoretical framework of connecting ontological order. So I turn now to introduce the Nayaka and through them, we'll see if and how we can understand their sociality and communality better. Um, so we said that hunting gatherers are all over the world. Um, Nayaka, one of the South Asian forager groups, this categorical class has not drawn as much attention as other regional clusters, and gases in South Africa, in Australia, in North America. Uh, but Janet Fortier estimated in an article published in 2013, Current Anthropology, that South Asian anti gases constitute about a quarter of the world present day and recent anti gases three times as many as in Africa and four times as many as in Australia. I, I'm not sure I will takes the figures as such, it's so difficult what you count and how, but definitely we don't speak about the marginal regional class of hunter gatherers. Few of the South Asian hunter gatherers have been studied in 40 words to current standards. Nayaka, who are known also as Katu Nayaka, Forest Nayaka, I hope are one of those who were studied to current standards. So they live in the They live in uh, the lower forest slope of the Nilgir Hills. I'd started to study them in 1978, notably a decade before I was running the alone organization, development, government organization, started, started working in this area 10 years after I started my field work. And two days I worked two, two decades before these organizations reached the hamlet I lived in. And a further decade before some missionaries arrived to one of the very, one of the outside the village hamlets that were part, was part of my group. And Nayaka did not hunt much, uh, but as, as well as gathering roots and fruit in the forest and fishing, they collect honey. Uh, and they know in the local literature and in the native area is good as skilled hunters, uh, honey hunters. Uh, I revisited them in uh, 1989, this time with a video camera that I had to very hastily borrow 
and had little time to learn how to use it. It's, it's a complicated story, I leave it here. So it's a very rough few minutes that I still nevertheless want to share with you from this video, just to give you a sense, uh, unedited, completely unedited uh, film of the field. I think it's only the second time that I show it. Uh, this was 10 years after I first visited them. So just let me see how I get organized with this.
So you have a basic idea, this is a, let's see now what we can, what can sense we can get there. So I want first to look, these people as you saw constantly, they use kinship terms for each other. Now I, I mentioned in the last lecture that relation uh, is used in, is used by Strasser, as not used, but as we all use the term relation, but as Marine Strasser show, uh, it, it has some logical, abstract, structural relation uh, senses from its co-use in the domain of knowledge and in the domain of uh, kinship since the uh, 17th century. So for clarity, you, some of you, well, someone asked here about relation, connection, for the time being I leave it aside, but I use the term connections, and I use the term connection word, which is one of my students, uh, are we prepared? Are we appropriately suggested? Moreover, I use the term kinning as to just suggest that to, to have kin is to make them kin. This action, this work, doing in order to keep and make and reassert relations. And actually, at least maybe because I'm not an English speaker, when you look at kinship, the term kinship, if you read the suffix sheep, S H I P, sheep, in the end, as a skill, for example, horse, horsemanship, rather than a position, dictatorship, then kinship really means a skill of making and keeping kin. So I use kinship kin in connections uh, as I look at what happens in one's America. So now I engage constantly in a historical connection work, alongside various sharing activities, as part of the work of kinning, and this opened for us a window onto their perceptions of the kinning process. They do, so, they do so through conscious and strategic use of relational terms uh, that are familiar to us as kinship terms, but we had to probe into their meanings for them. They do so in open space, so everybody can hear, not that there is any way to research the film, everything is open space. Domestic life, everything basically is done in view of everybody. And we should, I want to look when they use these kinship terms and how, and just to enlist your experience. How do, you, for example, if I ask, if you think about how do you address your parents? How do you address your children? How they address you? Do you use kinship terms or personal terms? We all alternate between using kinship terms in some contexts 
and using personal terms in others, David Schneider and George Thomas, in a really lovely paper, examined the alternate use of kinship terms and personal names in America, 1950s, white class, middle class, sorry, white, middle class America. And they, and they noted that children then address their parents as father and mother, and the parents address them by name, Johnny, Dorothy. The same goes for children and their uncles, aunt and grandparents. Occasionally, one of these relatives is singled out from the rest and is addressed by a personal name, Uncle John or John. And curiously, children always use a single person possessive term for this relative. My mother, my father, not our mother or our father, even if I have nine uh, siblings. And this mother is belong to our mother. Marilyn Strassan in the 20th century, by the late 20th century, described a new phenomenon of children occasionally addressing their parents by personal names. All three, like, all three uh, scholars argue that using personal names, foregrounded relative as a unique individuals with their own personalities, life circumstances, and self with unique individuals rather than role player. So when I say mother, I see her as a role in a, in a role game. As a role player, when I say Nurit, or when I say I, I singularize her as an individual. So they say, they actually argue that in English and American kinship uh, practices, the use of personal name and kinship term express the idea that being a relative is just one of many attributes of the person. The individual is consisting of many. Uh, parts drawn from many domains, his work, his profession, whatever, and the relative is just one of them. Uh, Schneider and Holmans put it nicely, the relative is less than the person. For now, I want to show you, uh, it's almost the opposite. Uh, now, you remember that I mentioned that Rubin said that all hunting gatherers use kinship terms to address each other. He called it a universal kinship system. But they also sometimes use personal names. And what I, what I want to really, really zoom on is how they alternate between personal names and kinship terms and what this says, what this began to show us about the society. So basically, they use personal names all the time when they engage with outsiders. The outsiders often introduce these names. Um, so just to give you an example of the kind of situation I experienced and other other scholars probably experienced, I asked my friend, who is now academic with my father, what is the name of a new arrival who just came to the hamlet and I didn't know it before. So he turned to this person, to this visitor, and asked him, Baba, brother-in-law, what is your name these days? And then he turned back to me and he said that his brother-in-law is called Madan, called the John, whatever, nowadays on the plantation. But Naika also occasionally uses these names among themselves when, why, and what does it tell us. Naika did not name newly born babies. No use for them kinship terms. Babies cannot respond to it. When toddlers start to independently engage with the others, they were addressed all by the same names, Maga for boys and Maga for girls is a word that means both son and daughter, and also male child and female child. Um, they explained to me that it is too difficult for young children, even when they can exchange and talk with others, to grasp the whole, my word, hyper-connected kinship system or kinship relations in such a small community. Uh, maybe they can understand that if someone calls them a child, they call them a father or a parent. But if someone will call them a nephew, then they have not only to call him his uncle, but they know that the sister is an aunt, and the son of the sister is a nephew. And, and all of these people are connected. Uh, so you can't use, even with a child who already speaks and already in, interact with others, you don't use for him kinship term, you use the same 
names, same names. So you don't individualize it by its own name, but there is two standard names that you use for the degrees. When an outsider marries a local girl and moves to live with her and her relatives, technically, because all of them are connected, they are actually mostly genetically, they are mostly connected by births and marriages, but even if not, they are all used for each other in terms. So technically, someone who marries in through his wife is immediately connected with everyone she's connected to, and she's connected with everyone else. So he's also connected. But Naika don't use kinship term for him for several months, sometimes a year or two, it depends on the, on the person and why. Because they say that to master alternative routes of connections, moreover, use them in a very clever strategic way takes time. Because each two persons can have many roots because everybody is so hyper-connected. You can, you can call someone my brother-in-law or you can call someone my brother. There the are different routes to go and someone who is clever can strategically foreground a close relation when I want you to share with me something or a distant relation when I say to him, don't, don't ask me, don't ask me for this or that. Um, so it takes time, and married people, even in married people, it takes time before they, they are addressed by kinship term, and then they know how to reciprocate and address. Uh, and uh, interestingly, in a study of the uh, Australian, I don't know how to spell it, Garinui, uh, Anthony, Anthony Redmond, neatly described how these people extend their kinning, their use of kinship terms, outwards to the horizons, and they turn, his words, relative strangers into strange relatives. So even strangers who are, who are relative strange, but you turn them into strange relatives, they better be relatives than a stranger. Most of the anthropologists are adopted by a skin. Oh, that's my, my king. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, most of the most anthropologists usually are adopted by kin, adopted as kin, and they usually self-gratify and say, ah, oh, I'm a nice anthropologist, I'm such a good anthropologist, these people realize it and they adopt me as a kin, but it's usually their system and their way of dealing with people, and we just enjoy it. Um, so, so personal names here do not mark the unique individual person, as in the English and American system. They use names in a liminal, provisional measures until one learns a web of connections. The kinship matrix that connects, they hyperconnect all members of the community to each other. The relative here is more than the person because being relative makes one part of society. Uh, to some extent, the kinship links follow one from another as friends and friends become friends, but the system here communally enclose and link together and link everyone together and at the same time separate, different each, differentiate each, time, each one from another and connect them all into this one thing. The system keeps everyone in a unique position, in his unique kinship network and yet connect everybody into the community without compromising on the position of the place. Let's move to the next, to another aspect. I will come to, I will come to explain extension of kinship term to the spirits in a minute, but for the moment, ah, here is just to show you how Naika interconnected to each other. It's a, the, they are really, really hard. So, and I want to look now at the counterpart of this kinship, the historical kinship work, and this is visiting, and I just read an excerpt from my book. Late morning, people are still relaxing by their hearth. The closely spaced fires providing warmth and comfort. Kungan's daughter, Kungan's daughter, uh, I'll skip this description. I think we are short of time. The idea is we saw the field. 
one woman go to start foraging, she doesn't consult with anybody, she just go. And then someone else come and follow her. You heard my breathing there because I suddenly realized before my eyes is a foraging group going. It's just one by one by one, you don't realize. There's no discussion, there's nothing before. So I joined them and that's why you heard my running, running. Um, so Naika can start going on foraging and it ends up visiting, visiting someone in another hamlet. Um, usually there's no, no planning ahead, no coordinated uh, action. One goes, someone else starts, decides to join him and follow him. Um, even when they're, they're set on uh, honey hunting parties, these small groups that go in night, darkness night, uh, I'm not sure they don't coordinate or decide. People sit in a circle and each one expresses his own view. And they go again and again and again until the views uh, meet together and then there is a decision. It's not arguing or convincing, but slowly, slowly kind of uh, getting, getting everybody to have the same view by this round of talks. Um, now, visiting is incredibly important, and even ecological and evolutionary anthropologists describe how extensively hunter gatherers visit each other. They visit friends, they want to see what is happening, they want to believe boredom. Uh, the extent of visiting, even ecological and evolutionary people say, is not explainable by ecological factors. What the visit do I suggest? There are the material counterpart of the rhetorical views of kinship terms, both working together to forge and keep kinship connections. On this visit, and I want you to remember it for our discussion next week of Airbnb, the visitors and their host continue their ordinary daily routines, taking care of their own needs, simply next to and sharing with Hamlet's for residents, and outside observers sometimes cannot distinguish who is a visitor and who is an ordinary uh, resident. Everyone continues their routines of foraging, or working in the plantation, collecting firewood, cooking, and so on. Uh, the hosts do not conspicuously outnumber the visitors because these are very small uh, camps. And the open living is such that you don't have your own private guest because everybody lives outside and you live next to other people. So guests very quickly uh, communicate, interact, blend with all residents and not just the, the so-called people who they visited. Through this visit by sharing food, sharing space, they carry on working on their kinship, uh, on their kinship communities. Um, and while, while the visits are not liminal, they don't have all these ceremonies that we may associate with guests, both. They're so just flowing, the people continue doing each their own activities while socializing, obviously, taking the opportunity. So we move to. I'm sorry, I'm usually used to read from the computer, so I'm. I'm too stuck, to, stuck in my own way, so just we separate. Here are some. Some photographs. And we move to a section I call, call to connect or not connect. Naya after death rituals of restoring connections. So I want to move to more exotica at this stage of the lecture. Uh, rituals that is ritual do uh, highlight and engenders local senses of the society. And I start with Barry Rachel <coughs> in engaging with a very famous article by James Woodbourne, who in 1982 compared four African hunter-gatherer societies, the Hadza, the Djibouti, the Baka, and the Kung. Uh, and he could include the Nayaka too, when he wrote that these people do little more than directly I, I quote, practical, the directly practical requirements for getting rid of a rotting corpse. They dig a shallow grave, place the body in it and cover it, or even leave the body in the hut, cause the hut to collapse on the crop, corpse, and then leave to another place. 
no specialists are involved in the barrier, no codes of specific behavior, no taboos, no prohibitions, ordinary life continues on. Now this lack of barrier practices strikingly stand out against high elaborate barrier uh, practices elsewhere, uh, I don't need to remind you, uh, and what one explanation for the lack of barrier breaking in this hunter-gather society is an absence, explained absence kind of argument. They don't have social stru structure, they don't have property. What do they need to uh, elaborate barrier ritual about? There's nothing to regulate. I observed the band, the Nayaka, certain if modest actions that take place outside the time and the place of the barrier, within the ordinary communal space and time, uh, and I want to describe them to you. The first is oil in water ritual. It takes place days after the ritual, the barrier. A shallow pit is dug and blades of grass are stuck at the wind. The, the top is sometimes tied together and, and, pit, and water is pulled down the, the grass to the water. When the drops of water reach the water and they meet and they join, people say with relief and excitement only, oh, it's good. It is a sign of utume, cooperation and togetherness, which are restored in the weaving disconnected works that the death created. A second ritual takes place, which involves a ring. Someone gives a ring to another to wear, uh, in remembrance of the dead, one or more rings can be exchanged. Uh, any two person can cover, can exchange rings. And additionally, everybody takes some items, ordinary items of the deceased, pots, bracelets, cups, uh, knives, and use them. From the use, they wear the, the rings, they use this object until the next major festival that I'll come to in a moment, which is a visit, not of other Naika, visits of other Naika and also for all the spheres everybody lives around. Now, meantime, it can take, it's a yearly festival, so it can take several months before the festival occurs. And meanwhile, people use this, this is the objects and wearings to remind them on the festive occasion, the rings and the objects are all brought and united with the rings and the objects of the previous uh, death, the uh, Nayaka regarded this ritual as really important and crucial, and they really attended to it with great seriousness. That the wish, that, you know, all these rituals that actually keep the presence of the dead person still around us, not so much the individual or the body as the relations and the exchange and the presence and the sharing that he was involved with, the objects stand for relations and not for the deceased individual. The passing between people keeps his memory, uh, keeps his presence around, as I say. This community with its flux and changing composition and with its human and non-human members is not bounded, is not verified, but all this exchange of objects an uh, intensive exchange of object created again as it creates a communal network um, now in some ways I don't know I'm just to, to wake up the younger one here it's pretty point far but the wonder of keeping the deceased possessions in circulation is and then joining them with the spiritual, with the other object of the disease, which means that they are joined, the dead, the new dead, the first, sorry, the first disease is joined this way and linked with the other dead, which is why it is so important for Naika. In some ways, if keeping the deceased possession in circulation is comparable with keeping Facebook accounts and pages of people as who died. Social network sites have their own respective regulations of where and how and on what jewel basis deceased accounts can be kept open. But Nayaka seems to handle this very same problem in a very elegant 
and with direct focus on connections. Um, one thing for sure is that from this connected perspective, not only do we see others and barrier rights linked to this, it is also possible to argue that the practical, casual barrier has its purpose. Elaborate barrier practices involve individuation and withdrawal of the dead body. And a sense of perspectival unification when the whole family, the whole nation, the whole group come together uh, to the grave uh, for one kind of sake. Service, service or another. This is all marginalized and counterpointed by diverting the attention to rituals of restoring connections between the living and between them and the other being past, present, and future. Remind me when I need to finish so I'll cut accordingly. Five minutes. Okay. So I'll jump over something that I described in great detail in the previous work, which is basically a virtual, a shamanistic equivalent to virtual evocation of uh, others and human beings. So there's a festival, there's a trance, there are shamans who fall into trance, they don't wear masks, they don't have any special role. Through them, other than human beings come and perform themselves. Nobody presents itself by name. Nobody say, I'm this or that. When I wanted to learn who is who, just come and listen for, the, for yourself. No, no classification of who is who, nothing. Just come and eat. And they come, and everybody talk with them. And the way you interact with them is the way you know who they are. They speak different languages, they shout, they, they speak slowly, they nervously run from place to place, they like this doing so that everyone has its own personality and you learn about it as you engage with him as a tenant. So this other than human being are also kinshipized, kind, they are shared bidies with and food with and they are talked with and they are teased, they are joked with and they actually become sort of virtual if you want beings through the interaction with them and they're not sorted into kinds. They are coming every time other people come and this whole loose coalitions, loose groups of very different beings, gods, uh, elephant, spirit elephants, uh, dead people, there's a huge variety of people other than human beings who come through the shamans and with all we who are attended connect, interact, make us ourselves their kin, both in sharing food with them and in calling them the same kinship, rhetorical work and sharing that we do with other people. So we extend the community of kin further on. So I come to the conclusion. And I hope to have convinced you a little that we see here connected logic at work with personal frames of action and memory. I forgot to say, and this is important when I cut down on the, the festival. I recorded conversation with the spirits. I sat with individual Nayaka listening to them, and each one hears something else or constructs it. The other being in his own way. They really have a personal action frame, and each as it good for him. So I go back to the conclusion. So we have here personal frames of action and memory, loose and flexible coalitions reflecting individual choices of what to do and say, performing links into being links, which are here framed as kinship, and the hyper-connected network of kinship links, uh, where each person is differently linked to others, which is the nature of the differentiation of kin by hyperlinks. And this system extends outwards to whoever, uh, whoever is linked with in this performative way of visits and use of kinship term to include a great diversity of beings, non-human spirit, the stranger. It is no wonder I think that the vocabulary for what one does when entering the digital web space to search for information and links includes such words as browsing, hunting, gathering, foraging. We use these words all the time, and I show you many examples in the last lecture. And vice versa, I suggest we can gain by drawing on the vocabulary for digitally based social networks, 
means to think with about the others apparently in deficient collective social structures. But I find the, I, I, mean, I don't trust this adaptation to say that I found the use of cloud for what in fact is a massive infrastructure of underground and undersea optical fibers and computers managed through service centers and highly guarded buildings, very amusing and ironical. It is an animistic perspective, if any, yet whereas for hunter gatherers, animistic approach serves engaging with and knowing who and what you engage with through the engagement. Here, this is animistic cloud, the, the use of cloud, just keep it a distant, invisible, unknown. Perhaps something similar distinguish between the kind of kinship connectivity that frame hunter gatherers, or at least in either life, and the digital infrastructure of our times. Hunter gatherers have access to their kinship collectivity, and they are the ones who form and we operate it, not a, a Mark Zuckerberg of one kind or another. Perhaps it's unavoidable. Perhaps Web 3.0 and diverse open codes and technical means will restore a democratic platform also at our, at our times. Anyway, the Hunter Gather Kinship problem platform, I think, present a minuscule model, very genius, very ingenious a platform, network, network of con connections that perform in the world, that is performed by actions of people. And, and I will return in the next lecture both to Airbnb as the main, and also to what can you remember that in the last in the second lecture, I said that evolutionary people make a lot of kinship uh, in studying social networks and their evolutionary uh, implication. I will return to the evolutionary implication of kinship when we see it in the way I suggest seeing it uh, in the course of society for you.